All right, I think we're live. So, confirm, guys, if you can hear me. Um, I think we're good. Uh, and yes, uh, let me just comment here. Tentacle difficulties were slowing us down. Can everyone hear me now? And I have some background noise, just FYI. Uh, I have a uh, some work being done in my house and they are banging away. So this is not gonna be one of your ones to keep, Sean, necessarily. So it is what it is. Uh, so guys, welcome to the updated live here. It looks like I'm on my phone versus the computer. There's been some issues there with Facebook. So, um, but uh, let's go. Let's crank it. Um, so I'm just going to start with the questions. Let me just give everybody a, a hello. Jeff Bruno, your outsource CFO. I've been doing this for over, you know, a year and a half or so, two years. Um, and um, I am happy to say it is December 21st, the end of 2021, the second year of our pandemic fund. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we are... You know, even though with this, these spikes happening recently, I think we are um, nearing an end to this thing come, uh, you know, end of next year, middle of the end of next year. So keep your fingers crossed that Omicron is less virulent and we are on the mend as a as country and as a world. With all that horrendous stuff behind us, let's move into business, end of year, financials, operations, Whatever it is you guys are dealing with, remember it's end of year, so be careful with taxes. That's not my area, but be careful. Manage correctly your inventory. Manage correctly your payables. If you're a cash filer, as probably most of you are, make sure you don't have extra profit that you're going to pay taxes on, that you don't need to pay taxes on. Um, all right, jumping into the questions. All right, first question is from David Monge. I think it's David Monge. Um, so David said, <clears throat> I'm having difficulty tracking my KPIs. I Googled a few, but not having any success. Any suggestions where I can get started? I'm a mortgage broker and makes and make sales calls to realtors, CPAs, attorneys, etc. And I need help keeping track how many calls I need to make to lock in an appointment. Building a sales metric. What are the things in my business I should be keeping track of to hold myself accountable and measure results? David. Lots to unpack there. So I've done, we've done a lot of work in, you know, real estate development, real estate. We do less of that now, but we have in the past. Uh, of course, mortgage broker is a big component of that. Um, and yes, you'd be calling on those people correctly. So um, <clears throat> there's two types of metrics here, David, that you should be aware of. There's financial metrics, operational, well, three types, financial and operational, which I would put in the category of operational sales. So you can put them into three or two buckets, finance, operational, and sales. So when you're talking sales metrics, I mean, there are tons of ways to look at that. That's the other guys on this, who met other mentors who can help you with the sales component. Um, what you should track, leads, how leads convert, probability of conversion, time to conversion, um, you know, how many do I need to effectuate a projection that I'm comfortable in that I feel like is a sustainable projection? And those are all what we would call in the business your leading metrics, you know, especially the sales metrics. They're always leading because you're looking at how I'm, I'm converting business into my pipeline and then converting it into sales um, so that you can project um, revenue coming in. Um, and you have to get good at that because really the crux of a business is one, managing cash and two, being able to look forward and, and have reliable projections within a range of tolerance. So in order to do that, you have to look at sales metrics as your, um, your key there. Um, so they're all leading. Other leading metrics on the financial end um, and operational end would be sort of, well, what do I need to break even? So if I can do, if I need 300,000 in revenue, and that covers me, 
and my other expenses, fees, transaction costs, whatever it may be, whatever that that is, um, what is that break even that I need? And then plan accordingly to say, well, how many dollars can I spend? So if you want to spend 10,000 on advertising, how much can I spend to then break even? And then if I spend 10,000, what's my ROI? So there's another metric. If I'm spending $10,000, what am I expecting in revenue and return on that? 10,000, maybe 100,000, 10 to one. Maybe 200,000, 20 to one. What are those metrics that all come together to pull this, put this puzzle together for you so you can really look forward and make the best decision, decisions in your business? So um, that's sort of an overview, but they all, they, all, they all come together. And then once you have your strong leading metrics, which are sales, uh, your operational break-even, uh, you might have a goal of a gross margin target by improving some of your, your scenarios or you're using tech to maybe you have all these things. Once you set that, you then have lagging metrics that are mostly financial to say, well, am I hitting those goals? Am I getting towards those goals? Is my margin improving slightly? I expect it to improve by one point every quarter. Is my um, break even decreasing? Because as I'm growing in revenue, I'm seeing my fixed costs are, are not growing at the same rate. So my break even is improving. Um, those are the lagging metrics you can see as well as you're, as you're moving into the future. So um, just a bunch of those things to consider. Um, so next question is from Kyle Elder. So Kyle says, um, Kyle Elder says, when hiring, how do I determine if I should pay salary versus hourly? Um, business description. I have a small athletic training facility working at previous gyms and hiring trainers at previous gyms. I've come to find it tough to keep people who are good at what they do around long enough to build a team when they are getting a few hours here and there at the beginning. Would supplementing their pay with front desk cleaning, etc. be the way to keep them? And what are the pros and cons to salary versus salary structure? So Kyle Elder, I, you couldn't, this couldn't be a better question from you. I hope you're watching right now. If not, watch on replay. But Kyle, ready? I own a gym. <laughs> so outside of my primary business, your outsourced CFO, um, which is financial strategy for small businesses, I actually own a gym. Um, it's a great gym. It's Anytime Fitness. It's a franchise. And uh, I love it. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time on it because I have great people running it, but I am the active owner. Uh, I do the finances for it, clearly. Um, and uh, so it is, you know, you ask, you're asking the right questions. Trainers, we've had the same problem. So recruiting trainers and getting them to do what they need to do and make themselves whole to make enough money, but also make the gym enough money. Let's say you're charging 50 per 45 minute session or 70 per 45 minute session of training or whatever your cost may be. Those trainers are getting at most 50%, 55% if you're really, really, you know, give them a good chunk of commission of those of those accounts. But they have to build them up, then they have to work them, then they have to build it up, they have to work them. It's the same conundrum that every business falls in. You have to sell and then you work and then you sell and then you work. So they fall into that. So it's hard to motivate them to keep them active. So what I've found has been working more recently is I'm pulling a team together much more. And I have my and I have a head trainer. So I have a head trainer and I have three trainers underneath that head trainer. And that head trainer, I give a 10K salary to a year, 10,000. So it's not a lot, but it's enough to fill in the gaps of where they're not making enough money in other areas. And they're doing things like running recruitment for trainers. They're helping the new trainers. They're um, putting together packages. They're um, the face of the gym, so to speak. Um, and the trainers get empowered by that. And then we set goals, very realistic goals. We say, look, we want you to hit this. If you're a new trainer and you're coming on, we'll set realistic goals and we'll say, all right, first month we want you to do 1,500 in training rate. Second month, 2,000, third month, 2,500. And 
what seems to have been working recently is I will give them higher commissions so that they can get a, a consistent client base. The gen's not making anything at, at all, really, in the beginning. But now you got them comfortable. Everybody gets to know each other. And I might give them like 80% month one, 70, 60, and then get them to like a 50 level when they start to get a base. And that way you're really getting them psyched up. They're motivated to push hard in the beginning because they're getting more commission early on to bring in them. The gym's making nothing. Um, but the idea is that you, you're getting a really, you're co bringing the team together effectively. That's the key. So they could also do some, you mentioned part-time, they could also do some part-time hours to help at the desk and so on, which also gets them in front of the people that need training. Sorry, but absolutely what you need to be doing. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, all right. So next question, um, is from, uh, Shari Duong. I think that's how you say it. Sh Shari Duong. Uh, should my extra money go to saving savings or debt? Question. I currently do not have a business and work in corporate America with one second job and go to school. I do currently have debt. And I'm trying to cash flow school as much as I can. I will have to borrow to cover next semester. I'm curious, where should I my focus be with my extra funds? I do know of the Dave Ramsey baby steps. Should I be following those steps? <laughs> sure, that's great. So um, I'm assuming your goal, obviously, is to start a business. Um, but here's my feeling on this. So the... The toughest thing to do, toughest thing to do in starting a business is one, to have debt coming into a business, like a lot of debt, and to be cash starved in the beginning of a business. Because you will make decisions that are not right for the business, that need to support you or your situation, and it's gonna cause problems. So real life example, when I started my business in 2013, came out of a CFO position for a mid-level company, was making decent money, went from decent money to zero. Yes, zero. Now, I didn't have any debt, but I was making no money. My wife at the time was a teacher, um, so she, was, she had a good consistent living, but she wasn't killing it. And we had a son who was just about one years old and I was starting this business. And I decided that I, I would, I told my wife and I said, listen, honey, for six months, I'm not gonna make anything. You're gonna have to be okay with that. Um, we had some savings, but we didn't have a ton. So I said, look, this is, this is the deal. And she was very, very receptive to that and let me, let me forge ahead. But if I had let the stress overwhelm me, I would have had to take the money rather than sort of focus on the business itself, focus on the development, focus on where I needed to be in my time. And I did, I hit my goals. And one of the other things that Sean would probably speak to all the time is I really focused on my goals. I set specific targets, wrote them down and hit them. Within a month, hit all my targets in the first year and a half. Um, so, but that's focus. And if you have cash pressure, you lose focus. So your question is really, should you go for savings or debt? So if you're going to open a business, I would lower your debt scenario because you don't want to have a huge debt scenario. And I would see how you can um, maybe get a little bit of savings as well or just make your situation improve so that's not a stress on you as you move into that scenario. Next question, Shelly Merrill. Shelly, how are you? Um, we know Shelly very well. Um, so. Shelly says, what, the important, what is the importance and how do I go about building a dashboard to track important numbers? So Shelly's a fire protection contractor. I've heard many successful business people say, build a tracking dashboard to track key elements. My question is, how? What is the best way to pull information from multiple databases? Is there software for that Excel spreadsheets? Can it be automated or is it done manually? Curious to heal, hear all of my mentor's ideas. So Shelly, ironically you say this, I would argue we're probably right at this point with you coming into January, not the dashboard point, but with the idea of what's next with what you really, really, really need to focus on.
to drive your business growth forward. So let me say something here. A lot of business, and this might be counterintuitive to what a lot of people say, but I'm going to say it anyway because that's what Sean likes. So here's what I'm going to say. Ready? Everybody listening? Who's on? Dashboards don't mean crap. Did I say it? Did I say that? So let me be very clear. Dashboards with a lot of metrics and a lot of stuff that looks pretty and has graphs doesn't mean anything unless those metrics are the metrics that are driving the most value for your business. Period. End of story. I don't care if I'm following utility. If utility for your bit, if you're a product business and not a person business, why, why would we track utility on a product business to figure out how much uptime of our machinery if we're just constantly running the machinery? It's not a, it's not a, it's not a relevant metric. Um, so just be careful what you do with dashboards. Don't spend an exorbitant amount of money. I like Excel at first. Um, and yes, there are more and more software solutions to pull in data correctly and then be able to maneuver it in Excel or there are some other softwares. Don't waste your money on some big expensive software. They, they like to deliver a lot of bells and whistles that are just not that helpful for your business. Focus on your key metrics. There should, from a leading standpoint, you shouldn't have any more than maybe three to five. From a lagging, maybe five to seven metrics at most that are relevant to the value creation for your business. Full stop. Now, there might be some sub things that influence those metrics, but you don't have to look at those sub pieces until you see if that metric's out of line, like contribution margin or percentage of marketing you know, towards my revenue target or w whatever it may be, your CAC for that example, for your cost. Whatever those key things are in growing your business, stay on them and have them in front of you monthly but don't worry about the bells and whistles. Next question. Joshua Grant says, what data should I be tracking weekly? I'm, I see on the AO mobile app, Sean asked if we were tracking data. <clears throat> what kind of data should we be tracking? I'm in the welding and fabrication business. Right now, I keep all my, with, up with all my material expenses, labor costs, and overhead costs, utilities, rent, travel, etc. Okay, so Sean is right. Um, you should track data, but I'll go back to my earlier point, Joshua. Only track the data that is relevant or the sub-data that affects that data that is relevant, if needed. But um, in the welding business... So you are right. You need to keep track of things like material expenses, labor costs, and general overhead costs. I would absolutely put those in those buckets. Um, so you need to be able to understand things like um, how many hours should I allocate to this project? So you gotta you got to probably budget your projects. So if I'm going to do a well, you know, 100 hours for this project, you might want to do something like, I'm going to budget 100 hours. Now, if your guys are messing around a little bit and utility-wise they're a little bit low, okay, that's a discussion on the, the management of the team. But if they get the job done within 100 hours that you're billing to the client, great. If they're messing around on the job site a little bit, that's a different metric that you would then say, hey, guys, like, I love you, but... We're not taking two-hour lunch breaks when we're trying to get this job done. So those are the kind of operational slash financial metrics that interplay with each other that you might want to track, especially on a welding job. But, but you have to have a budget first. How many hours to do this job? And then keep that data as you're running with the project. So then you can get more efficient with it. So as you start to see, well, wait a second. If I have the material on site the day before, that saves me 10 hours of time and logistics of waiting for this material to come and this material to come and this. Well, that's going to save me this much in cost of my labor. Wow, throws two more GP, three more G point, B, gross profit points to my bottom line. Let's do it. Let's throw that on site. Let it sit there for a day or two. Who cares? 
Those are the kind of things you want to think about when you're trying to build the business because gross profit or contribution dollars go right to your bottom line when you have fixed expenses like your salary, the rent, the utilities, your travel, stuff like that, that you're all budgeting as fixed expenses. You need that. You need the GP dollars to cover that. So hopefully that is some example. Um, Jenny Dawson asks, what is the difference between cash and accrual accounting? Oh, Jenny, here we go. <laughs> um, Jenny says, I lead yin yoga and sound healing events, classes and training, partnering with various business organization yoga studios. On occasion, I'll handle registrations and collect funds, but more often than not, ticket sales are managed on their side and I am paid at a later date, which is usually the following month. Ticket prices are different for general admission versus member discounted rates, and we split the revenue based on profit share. With ranges from 70 to 30, 60 to 40. I do not see the numbers until I receive the recap, which includes details such as number of participants, ticket price, etc. This is getting long here. I'm going to cut this, Jenny. <laughs> Payments for weekly classes come at a different time than normal events. Um, she'll sell, you're going to start selling yoga classes online. I, and you feel confused on how to track revenue weekly with money coming in from different places at different times. Okay. So she really wants to understand the difference between cash and accrual accounting. Awesome. So. Accrual accounting. So if you really have to have a good bookkeeper who understands accrual accounting, because the biggest thing with accrual accounting, and by the way, I think you should run accrual accounting. And, you, and if you're a small business, you're probably going to run cash accounting for your taxes, but that's a different scenario. So the main difference between accrual accounting and cash accounting, the main difference in re reference, at least to a small business, is what are, when is my revenue recognized? That's the biggest thing. Like you were saying about your ticket sales. When do I recognize that? And then when do I recognize the resulting COGS or variable costs, in a sense, that are part of that revenue. They need to be aligned. That's accrual. That's aligning your rev rack with your costs. When did I recognize the revenue? When did the cost hit? It should be the same time you recognize the revenue. So the reason that is, is because that gives you the true visualization on your business profit. If you don't do that, you don't have an idea if you're making money. That's the main difference between accrual and cash. I kind of asked you could... Do all these things and then next month all the cash comes in and you paid all the costs last month and now you're upside down on your P&L and you have no idea whether you're making money or not. You might have a 20% profit margin, but it's all intermingled between these two months and you can't pull it apart and it's a total mess. That is what the problem with cash accounting. It doesn't allow you to right size your profit. So you have no idea if you're making profit or not. And then it becomes a problem because if you get in a sticky wicket, and you're not managing tightly, and something happens where you have to pay all this cash out at one point for contractors or salaries or whatever, you can get in a, a cash situation, and then you could fall behind, and then you start to depend on deposits to fund your operation, which I see a lot of business owners do, and now you're behind constantly because now you're using deposits from the next event's coming, to fund the payments from before because you don't know what your profit is. So you're assuming you're okay, but you're really using deposits on the next events to figure this out and keep your business going. That's how businesses die, okay? Real fast because eventually it catches up with you. And if you don't have good capital reserves or a good line or something and you have no visibility, you got a business. So very, very important to um, to do accrual. And if they're good bookkeepers, so you don't necessarily have to, do, I, I would not recommend you do accrual if you're not financial oriented, have a bookkeeper do it. If they're good bookkeepers, they really know what accrual is and they need to do it. If they're, if they don't know what it is, then get a new bookkeeper <laughs> because you need accrual to run your books. Um, we emphasize that with all our clients. If they're not, we tell them to get a new bookkeeper or a new controller in place who knows how to run a crew or we can't correctly look at their lagging profit information we can estimate it but we, we don't have it for sure 
Great topic there, Jenny. Very, very important in growing your business. Um, next question, Darby Scott. When you have a fleet of vehicles, should you aim to keep all the vehicles out in the field every day or keep one as a backup in case maintenance is required? This description. <clears throat> we have a fleet of mobile pet grooming vans. There are three out of six days in which all our vans are on the road, and we are considering having all the vans on the road all six days. We are closed on Sundays for basic maintenance. Bigger mechanical fixes require taking vans to a shop where they are always closed on Sundays. My concern is that we, if we never have a van off the road and something comes up that week that requires a week or more repairs, which actually happens every quarter, we will have to pull employees from the regular schedules, which affects their pay and recurring client schedules. Domino effect would be that clients become upset because rescheduling is difficult with full schedules, and we may lose clients as well as employees who have, who have had their schedules cut. I also understand that a vehicle not being used is a vehicle not bringing in money. But the former seems to be more harmful and more of a loss than the latter, in my opinion. I love advice on this. Wow, Darby, that's a great question. Um, so, um, Darby, I think that is a tough one. Um, good question, but tough. Because you're right. You want the van on the road because it is a it is a point in, in creating revenue. It is a direct revenue creator for you. Um, no question. Um but yes, vans always break down. They're running hard. They're commercial. They run hard. So um, I think you have to do an evaluation. I, I think you really have to sort of throw those numbers together and, and do, a, do a calc. So, you know, if you do worst case scenario, it's down 10 days or two weeks, one van, and you can't rent another van, or if you rent one, what is the cost to do that um, to keep the schedules going? And then if you were, if that does cause you downtime, what's worst case scenario with downtime? So how many clients could you lose? How many employees would you interrupt? I would do a hypothetical there to see what that looks like. Um, so you could see, I would probably bet that your hunch is right. I'd still want to see a calculation, but I'd probably bet that if you have one on reserve, so that if that happens, you don't have problems with the delivery in the longer run, meaning three months or so, you probably with that, meaning you retain more clients. So there's a metric you track is attrition of your clients, but you have better or attrition or retention. You have better retention clients. Your revenues don't dip because you weren't down. Um, so that relates to your gross profit or your overall profit, track gross profit in that case, and see what those numbers look like if you were to dip. And do a comparison, but I think you're right. I think leaving one in, in in maintenance is good, and then have extra capital to buy a new van, and always keep one in maintenance, one sitting there on the ready, like uh, like Maverick on Alert Five for the uh, the older crew here, older meaning forty and up here. All right, Alert Five, keep an Alert Five there. <laughs> See you guys. Next question, Ricardo Delgado asks. How do I start working more on the business first in the business? When do I start backing off from the day to day and begin thinking more strategically? I'm building my barber shop and it seems like I'm losing focus on building a team because I'm working 56 hours a week in the business. Should I, should I hire someone to help me with all the small things? Um, again, Ricardo, very, very, very typical problem with a small business. So um, you should do whatever you can to whatever you cash you have available to start to scale your business. So if you're making profit and you're comfortable with putting some of that profit into the growth of your business, which I assume you are at this point, then absolutely hire someone to take tasks off your plate so you can focus more strategically. If you cannot focus more strategically, you will, you will be capped at how much you can grow this business, full stop. No question about it. Um, take the easier tasks off, less expensive. Take those off first. Then as you're getting comfortable with that, some of the harder tasks that are maybe around management, scheduling, um, eventually people to cut hair or whatever the case is, um, get those people in. Um, but it's all about correct planning, when to, when do you have enough capital. You know, these days and age, this day and age, um, you know, we're recommending people have a good three to five months of 
operating capital on hand. So for the what if scenarios, Omicron is raging here. So what if people bail on appointments um, and your revenue takes a hit, but your costs don't go away, you're still paying rent, still paying your people, stand around. Um, so have backup there, um, but be ready to take that hit and also be ready to take the hit profit wise to invest in the growth of your business. But what does that look like? If you take those tasks away from you, what are you going to accomplish as an owner? What strategies can you implement? Can you, can you figure out better pricing? Tweak it up a little in some areas. Tweak it lower in some areas to get a higher overall m m revenue in. Figure out some cost cutting. Um, look at expansion opportunities, partnerships, strategic, whatever that may be that will help you continue to grow the business and grow your profit and or revenue essentially the most value for your company, that's where your head needs to be. So I totally agree with you. Um, so those were it for the questions today. Um, very good stuff. Uh, again, all accrual counting, everybody. Not for tax. Tax is totally different. Don't let the accountants screw, uh, skew, skew you another way. Accountants, especially accountants who are just, just focused on that, think, how do we minimize taxes? I don't think about that. I think about tax strategy, but I don't think about just minimizing taxes. So you need to have an accrual mindset for your books, even if the accountants say, ah, don't worry about that. Just give me cash because we're doing a cash for your taxes. That's all they're thinking about. You will never have clarity in your business unless you look at it from an accrual standpoint. It's the end of the year, guys. Set your goals for 22. Let's crank it. I'll be here. Give me your questions. I love it. Good to see everyone. Happy New Year.